had somewhat of an introduction. I've had a little TV repair shop up 6th Street for about 24 years now. And as the TVs become more complicated, I find myself being phased out a lot of what I do, so I started jumping into uh, TV antennas. And it's been a real, uh, I guess you could say, a real journey trying to learn about some of the secrets of how to get a good reception with a television antenna. And I'm also going to talk about some of the other devices you could use, such as streaming video devices like a Roku. I imagine probably everybody here knows what a Roku device is already, but in case you don't, it's just a little dongle you can plug into your HDMI port on your TV. And it will allow you to stream video from your router, your wireless router, right to the TV, and give you high definition video. It's amazing what they're capable of doing with something this small. I think it's made by alien technology myself. There's little people nobody knows about that uh, they make this stuff. Anyway, um, so one of the first myths I wanted to talk about is this idea that there's such a thing as a high definition antenna. What's the other term I've heard? 4K antenna, high definition antenna, digital antenna. There's no such thing as a digital antenna, 4K antenna, or any of these things. Antennas are antennas. In fact, if you happen to have one of the old style antennas, such as this one right here, these things are great. This antenna is designed to get both VHF and UHF frequencies. And, um, you know, it's funny how many people come in my shop and they ask me, do you have one of these new digital antennas I've been hearing about? I say, no, you don't need one. And so, um, the only thing, if you have an antenna like this already on your house, the only thing you might consider doing to enhance it is to get an amplifier attached to it and boost the signal up a little bit. And, uh, you know, these antennas, they can last for years. They can last a lifetime. There's really very little that can wear out on them unless the elements break off. That does happen sometimes, but um, for the most part, you should be able to use them for, for a lifetime. Now, one of the things I discovered around uh, this area is that the television frequencies that we want to try to pick up, they're either going to be on UHF or VHF. Now, I'm, I'm sure a lot of you can remember the days when our televisions had a little loop on the back of them that looked like this. It was called a UHF antenna. And then there was the rabbit ear antenna, and it just had the two uh, telescoping elements of stick like this. And this is a lot of what a lot of people used uh, for a long time. Now, an antenna like this is not going to work as well as an outdoor antenna. But a lot of times you can get by with something as simple as this. And so when I go out to install an antenna for somebody, one of the first things I do is I say, well, let's try, uh, let's try an indoor antenna and see how it works. Because a lot of times you might live in that perfect location where you can get away with a set of rabbit ears or something like this uh, little bar here made by RCA. It's got a little uh, amplifier built into it. And so I always recommend start with this. Um, you see a lot of these flat antennas too. These been out on the market. They're advertised as being some kind of new technology that's going to give you super reception. And they're not that great. If you do have one, I recommend you try putting it in a window. It's probably going to work a little better. Another secret is knowing where the translators are located for your particular uh, channels you're trying to pick up. Now what I've noticed is when I go to different parts of Josephine County, I pick up different translators. And um, one antenna isn't necessarily right for all locations. So let's say I'm in, in my, my shop is on 6th Street. I found the best antenna for where my shop is is the UHF antenna. And that's because all the translators are broadcasting on the UHF frequency. So something like this can work quite well. It does have directional properties to it, so it's very important that you get it aimed in the right direction. So this would be the front of the antenna here, and it's just a matter of finding out where the translators are and pointing at the translator. Now one of the things I've run into, I get calls from people all over the county, and I recently had a call from a woman in, in uh, what was it, Wolf Creek. And because she lived right next to a humongous mountain, I found myself in a situation where I couldn't get any signal by pointing at the uh, translator. What we discovered is if I took my direction finder here and I pointed at a mountain nearby, I was getting a reflected signal. And so it can really pay to take the time to find out exactly where the signal's strongest. <coughs> now one thing that really surprised me, we, we all had this belief, or at least I used to, that the best place for an antenna is as high as possible. Well, that may be true in the city, but here, when you're surrounded by mountains, that's not necessarily the case. 
I had a situation not that long ago where I, I was uh, looking for the best single. I went into the gentleman's backyard and I found just about four feet off the ground was the best place we could get the signal. So I went up on the roof just to see if it improved it and I lost the signal. And I hated to have to ask him this, but I said, sir, are you okay with me putting this antenna in your backyard? He said, sure, if that's what it takes, that's fine. So that's what we did. And that's usually the case when you're surrounded by a lot of trees. The trees uh, have a little canopy effect that uh, you want to try to get under the trees. But there's no rule that's set in stone. You always have to find out in each situation what, which works best. Um, also, now, the, uh, the other thing I've run into quite a bit, a lot of people have multiple TVs in their house, and they'll want to know if I can hook up an antenna so it'll go to several TVs at once. And you can do that. One of the things I ran into, I discovered that when you split a signal to go to multiple rooms, you weaken the signal. So you want to make sure that you have some sort of an amplifier to, to keep the signal good and strong. Now, sometimes you'll get away without it. I always like to try without it first because I don't want anybody to spend any money they don't have to. But if you do need an amplifier, it's called a distribution amplifier. Basically, what it's set up to do is you just put your antenna input into one of these jacks here. And this particular one has four outputs. So if I had four televisions, I could hook all four TVs to this little amplifier right here. Now, if you buy a distribution amplifier, you want to make sure it covers the frequencies of the broadcast in your particular neighborhood. This one here is only good for VHF, and you want to make sure you get one that's for VHF and UHF, or one that's dedicated for, for UHF. Now, some of the other nice things that I've recently become familiar with are the uh, Roku devices for streaming video off the internet. And I, I'm really impressed at what something this small can, can do, the quality of the pictures you get. And I imagine everybody here probably knows what YouTube, at least I hope you are. Can I see a hand as to how many of you don't know what YouTube is? OK, good. Well, I don't need to tell you what a wonderful asset it is to be able to access all that information on YouTube. But as soon as I found out about it, I was pretty much done with television. Put me in front of a computer and a YouTube browser, and I'm, I'm good. But uh, for those that do love um, you know, getting all the major networks and whatnot, um, some of them can be picked up with an antenna, and some you'll have to get through a, through a Roku device like this, or any kind of streaming device. It doesn't have to be Roku. And that will enable you to stream the video uh, right to your television. Or you could buy, for example, this, this little device here. It's called a Comcast unit, and it's uh, designed to plug into the HDMI port on your TV. What it allows you to do is mirror whatever you're seeing on your, on your tablet or your phone right to your TV. And I know that's a problem for a lot of people that want, that have limited data, you know, to use their phone to stream video in that way. But if you live in an area where you don't have any option, that might be one thing you might want to consider going with. So that's, that's a few of the trade secrets here. It took me a while to figure all this out. Um, but, uh, I'm glad I did. Oh, here's another thing I meant to talk about, the uh, digital converter boxes. Now, a lot of you probably remember when they first switched over from analog to digital, you had to have a box to make your old TV work, and it was called the digital to analog converter. And let me see, did I say that right? Digital to analog was analog to digital. Yeah, digital, digital to analog. These put out a, a signal that's not high definition. Most of the old ones do. They have some newer ones now that actually put out a high definition signal. Not only that, but a lot of these new converters actually have a little USB port on them where you can plug in a, um, a thumb drive and you can record just like a VCR. So these things are becoming the new VCRs now. And so instead of having you know many cabinets full of videotapes or DVDs, you can have a little thumb drive and have quite a few videos on it that way. Now one of the things that surprised me, sometimes I'll show up at somebody's house and they have a new flat screen TV, and I'll see that they've got a converter box up to their flat screen TV, and I say, what are you doing? You're getting an inferior quality picture putting this thing in line. You don't need it. If you've got a flat screen TV, chances are it already has a digital TV tuner built into it. So there, there's uh, probably no need for this, unless your tuner went bad on your TV, then that might be a cheaper option rather than getting it repaired. Um, 
you know, as far as amplifiers go, I've been trying a variety of different amplifiers for the posting the signal up. And, you know, I haven't found any one particular amplifier that's, that I would consider the best at this point. I know that if you over amplify a signal, sometimes you will actually lose a signal or the TV can't handle it being too strong. I haven't had that happen yet, but I've been warned about it. But uh, my favorite amplifiers for the antenna signals are the two-piece amplifiers. And basically part of it goes on the antenna itself and uh, the other part of it goes inside of your house. And this particular one here is designed for two televisions. And I've seen situations where the signal is so weak, if you don't have one of these, you're not going to get anything. Now, I've been making a, a map of where the signals are strongest, and I found out there are certain areas in Grants Pass here where you get a real strong signal, and, uh, and they're all on the UHF frequency. So you don't need to put up a big monstrosity of an antenna, although sometimes it's necessary. Most people would rather go with something smaller, and this is here as a UHF antenna. I found that anything from, probably from about the fairgrounds way down Redwood Avenue or along the river, we usually do pretty good with a UHF antenna like this. It doesn't have to be this particular antenna. They have some that have a, a lower profile or you know, less, less of an eyesore. And that, that could be an asset if you're in a trailer park where maybe they don't allow antennas. Uh, something like this, I do recommend you get it above the houses if possible, but Again, I've seen situations where, you know, going from the ground to the roof, all of a sudden we lose the signal there too. So it's all, all an experiment. So, um, let me see. I was afraid to write anything down on the script because once I start reading, I get confused. I just like to hang it. But is there any questions that anybody has about, uh, yes? Uh, just a minute, please. Anyone has a question, please raise your hand and I'll give it to you. Does the uh, amplifier help with the buffering? No, the amplifier won't do anything for buffering. That's a separate issue. That comes. That's an internet issue, either from a slow computer or a slow internet connection. Uh, this yeah. is right off the antenna. Yeah. Right. Just running the straight antenna. It seems like anything from vehicles to trees to different things affect your signal. The trees, did you say? Yes, yes, absolutely. Trees can be a problem, especially power lines. Um, that can be a, real, be a real annoyance there. So um, sometimes you have a situation where you're just not going to get all the channels you want. And when I do an antenna for somebody, I have to let them know up front. I can't guarantee what you're going to get. I can just say, based on experience, I think there's a good chance you're going to get at least a, you know, a couple of two or three networks. Well, we've, uh, we're in a favorable spot, so we get pretty much up everything. Yeah. And, uh, but you'll be watching a program and then all of a sudden it'll start buffering, be interrupted. Yeah, that's a bit of a headache. I've, I've seen that uh, during different weather conditions that can affect the signal a little bit. And also um, other sources of interference. In fact, I, I had the fortune of running into a gentleman that used to do antennas for a living and he told me some stories about the kind of things he's seen interfere with television reception. In one case, he said he saw a, uh, he couldn't get this one channel to come in turned out to be the, the heater in this fish aquarium. Uh, it was putting out a signal that was affecting the television reception. Now in the old days it was easy to spot if there was some kind of interference. Do you remember the old analog TVs if somebody turned on the vacuum cleaner you'd see a lot of snow on the screen? Well you don't see that anymore so you, you don't really know what's going on unless you have something called a spectrum analyzer that lets you see exactly what's, uh, what your TV is picking up. So it's good to know about that. Uh, was there any other questions? Yes. There's so many people here. I think. <laughs> Who had a question? Yeah. You also get all the channels that aren't regularly broadcast on TV, like the 200 numbers and the 300 numbers that you get on, on Dish. Oh, absolutely not. No. So all yes. you get is the local broadcast. Right, right. And what what's happening now? Um, you know, remember the old days with the TVs, you basically had two tuners on it. You had one that was for UHF and one that was for VHF. And you knew exactly what frequency you'd be picking up based, based on the channel you were getting. Like channel two was a specific frequency. Well, now they assign numbers to these channels that has nothing to do with the actual frequency you're picking up. So you don't really know if you, what you're picking up is on UHF or VHF. And what'll happen a lot of times, you'll hit the auto program button on your TV 
you might notice that you're on the same channel three times when you hit the channel up or down button. You wonder, why am I getting this number over and over? And it turns out that you're picking up three different translators in some cases. And so that's a little bit of an annoyance to have to hit your channel up or down button. But you are limited as far as what you're going to pick up. Now here at Grass Pass, I find that I'm able to get, uh, gosh, I wrote it, wrote it down on a piece of paper. I don't know if I misplaced it here. Well, I had it here somewhere. Anyway, basically I get ABC, NBC, CBS, and PBS, and Fox. Not the Fox News Channel a lot of you are familiar with, but uh, uh, Fox, whatever it is. And, uh, and their sisters, Me TV, and the other sisters. That right, right. And what's nice is now these, these channels, they're no longer just one channel. Like PBS is now three channels. Um, what is it, five is NBC, is, if I'm not mistaken, that's two, two channels. Um, Twelve is two channels. Ten, ten is now four channels. And then there's the religious programming. It's all Adventist programming around here, so if you, any of you are Adventist, I'm sure you're in heaven about that. Um, but, uh, you know, you are somewhat limited. Now, one of the options, uh, if you've got a Roku device, and let's say you're in a situation where there's a particular channel, you want to cut the cord, you're tired of paying these high fees to the satellite or cable companies. You want to cut the cord, but there's just one channel you have to have. Well, it might be that that channel is available through the Roku. You can add the application to your Roku, uh, what they call the home page, and that will give you access to that particular channel. And, of course, there's a fee involved, unfortunately. You know, and, much? Um, you know, it depends on which particular application you want. Like, I believe it was the other day a gentleman had to have ESPN. So he went online and we found out we could get it through, uh, what was it, Sling TV, 1999 a month or something like that. And, but, you know, sometimes it pays to search around because a lot of these things that you're paying for, you might find out there's a way to get them free. And it really pays to go on YouTube or Google or whatever and just put in, you know, ask the question, how can I get a particular channel for free? Now, a lot of people ask me about the Fox News channel. If I give up my satellite or cable, will I get Fox News? And what I found is that a lot of the Fox News programming is available through YouTube. So even if you don't have a subscription to satellite or cable, you may be able to get it on YouTube. And so that's, that's a nice thing to know. And I found, boy, that the, the amount of information available on YouTube, I just love it. I mean, you know, when my truck broke down, I was able to get on there and find out how to change the fuel uh, pressure regulator. If I have a psychological problem, I want counseling, I get on YouTube and I... <laughs> There's always some guy that thinks he knows all the answers. And sometimes they do, you know. I remember one time I was trying to figure out whether I should loan somebody money. And this guy told a story about, uh, you know, he kept digging himself in deeper the more somebody enabled him. And I, I said, that's it. That's all I needed to hear. But... Uh, so I think, I think YouTube's a really fun forum. It's, it's interactive too, you know, we can, we can actually get on and make our own videos and, and comment about what somebody said. We can uh, uh, give a video a thumbs up or a thumbs down. And we can tell by the ratings a lot of times if the, the video is worth watching. Now one of the things that this, uh, this Roku remote has, which I really like, uh, this particular one has a volume control on it that will, uh, can be programmed to operate on your particular TV. And some of the more advanced ones have a little uh, slot for a uh, SD card. I don't know if it's SD, what is the uh, micro SD, where you can plug one of those in, and I guess you can watch some of your pictures. I don't know if you can stream video from that or not. And, uh, and some of the, some of the uh, Roku devices have what they call video outputs on them. So let's say you don't have one of the newer TVs and you're not about to buy one. You can still stream video from what they call the RCA output jacks or line level output jacks. And so you don't have to spend the big bucks. And these things are cheap, by the way. I mean, uh, the lowest end Roku stick, I think I paid $30 for it. Uh, you know, it's hard to believe something this cheap will give me a, a high resolution picture. But yeah, $30 over it, I think it was Walmart. Uh, well, I'll pause for a minute here and see if there's any more questions. Oh, he'll be right with you. I saw two hands go up, and so which? Yeah. I do have some some input. I uh, I recently uh, I've about two years cut the cord here now, so I'm. Uh, Hold on a second. They can't hear you in the back. Right? Okay. Yeah. Um, 
in January, uh, two years ago, I, I cut DirecTV off and I'm really enjoying saving $100 a month. And um, also, I found that after a very short period of time, I didn't miss anything that I was watching. I mean, there's a few shows that I would have liked to catch up on, but I have um, uh, Amazon Prime and then Netflix, and then I recently dumped Amazon Prime for Hulu, and Hulu has an option now for live TV, and in some markets, they're actually streaming your live local channels, uh, but they are, um, they carry Fox Business, uh, Fox News, CNBC, MSNBC, all those uh, stations, plus uh, a number of the other um, normal cable networks. And uh, so, and that's for $39.95 right now, they're running that. And um, uh, what I found was on my connection, which is only about one megabit, um, live TV would continually buffer where their archived um, programs ran fine uh, on my one megabit, which is a really slow connection. Um, so anyway, that's, that's just my input to that. Uh, you can have uh, a lot of the local and some of the cable stuff um, through some of these streaming carriers. And there's a lot, of, lot more um, companies that are adding this besides Hulu as well. Well, that's going to put me out of the antenna business. <laughs> don't tell anybody. I don't think so. No, I appreciate Because antenna is free. Information. Uh, yeah, that's good to know about internet speed because um, what will happen, what I understand the Roku device does, it actually lowers the resolution of your video so that you can still watch whatever it is, even if you've got a very slow connection. But there are certain limits. I think I was surprised to hear you tell me you could actually get uh, watchable video off one megabyte per second. That's amazing. Well, it's, it's actually less than one megabyte. It's one megabit. There's a misconception about uh, internet speeds. Uh, one, one megabit, it takes six of those to make one megabyte. So it's actually one sixth of a megabyte per second. So this is pretty slow, really. That, that's, that's good to know, though, because I, I wasn't sure what the limits were. We have another question over here. Yes. Yeah. Do you have any RF filters? You can filter out just this channel and put it in the amplifier. RF filters for what? For your antenna? You know, I tried one because I was told, I uh, talked to a gentleman at Channel Masters, and he mentioned that sometimes the cell phone frequencies would interfere with the look with your television television uh, amplifier. And I tried looking one up. I couldn't see any difference around here. And by the way, I, I mentioned earlier that sometimes you don't know what sort of signals can be affecting your reception because of the new digital channels. You won't see it on the screen. Um, this is kind of a funny story. This uh, gentleman that did antennas for a living told me that he had this one strange interference pattern on his TV. He noticed that every so many seconds, the interference would come back and go away. It turned out that there was a rotating sign. I don't know how far away, that when it rotated at just the right angle, it would mess with his reception. So, now I've noticed that with cars going by sometimes. I have an antenna that I'll put right in front of my shop sometimes. As soon as traffic goes by, I can see the signals mess with. And you're going to see that more so with the rabbit ears. So that's, that's one of the problems with having an indoor antenna, unless you have a very strong signal. You're likely to see what they call pixelation on the display as you walk by the antenna. And you know sometimes you can move it around and whatnot. One of the frustrating things though with the new TVs, let's say you hit your auto program button on your TV and you want to put all the programs in the memory bank and then maybe you can fine tune your antenna to find out exactly you know, the best position for it. Well, it turns out that unless you pick up the channel to begin with, it won't be installed into your memory banks of your TV. So that can be a little bit of annoyance as well. And that's where something like this can really come in handy, where you can you know, fine tune exactly where to point the antenna and whatnot. But uh, like I was saying, I always like to start with something like this before going out and spending any money. And uh, anyway, uh, more questions? You'll be right here. Just a minute, please. Look, I'll give you a microphone. How is my ham radio antenna going to be affected by the regular one? You have a ham radio antenna in your house? Yes. Well, you know, it depends on how close it is to the TV antenna. 
I would be more concerned about what it's going to do to, to your TV and your neighbor's TVs when you transmit. <laughs> because I know a thing or two about ham radio because I'm a ham operator myself, and uh, I've seen a lot of uh, a lot of RF interference. Had to, had neighbors get upset with me, in fact, because I was coming out on their televisions. <laughs> Well, um, yes. I'll be right here. Here comes the microphone. Run, run, run. Thank you for waiting. Am I going to be able to use a Roku on my TV in conjunction with DirecTV? I don't want to get rid of the DirecTV, but I want to be able to get uh, Netflix or YouTube's on the TV. Can I do that through the Roku? Yes. Absolutely. All you have to do is change inputs on your TV. In fact, what surprised me the other day, I had a call from a woman who, uh, that one of these satellite companies actually installed a regular antenna on her house that would interact with her satellite receiver. And it came up in her normal menu. So that what it was, they realized they're, they're starting to lose a lot of customers. They wanted to keep her happy, so they come up with a system now where she's walking or watching her local channels, which she couldn't get through satellite, through an antenna. And that way, I think, she, what do they charge, an extra $10 a month to get local programming through the satellite or something like that? Another scam. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, um, you know, they, they did that to keep her happy so that uh, she could still get her local program without paying anything any extra. And I noticed there, there are a lot of devices that will now stream video. If I'm not mistaken, some of the uh, some of the satellite receivers now have the ability to also stream video off the internet, and I think that probably is true with the cable. Though I'm not sure, but they they know that the cable companies know that this is a big thing that people want to be able to start streaming, and so they're they're trying to keep everybody happy. I, I see another gentleman in the back there with his hands up, so I'll give him a little second to get the microphone over there. Okay, he really doesn't need it, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> Um, one of the things that you were talking about was DISH decided to put a sling box in their receivers. And what sling box does is it allows you to get all of your channels through the internet. So you can be out of town, you can hook to the internet, and you still get the signal from your, from your box at home. And I went away from that myself when I just bought the sling box unit itself. I plug it into the back of my... Um, box from Spectrum and I can watch TV wherever I am with it. Plus Spectrum app now allows you to walk, to watch on your tablet or your laptop. So if you want to skate away and get rid of one of your boxes, that's one way to do it. That's good to know, thank you. I'm just curious, how many people here aren't streaming video already? There's a few people. I'm surprised, you know, I've, I've gone out to some people's homes and they, they don't even know they've got a smart TV or what it's capable of. And they're just watching a handful of channels and I say, do you realize that you've got a smart TV here that you could be streaming all this video? Now one of the things I've run into though with some of the original or the first edition smart TVs is they won't get a, they won't get a lot of applications. Very limited, they might only have Netflix and a couple other things on them or a weather channel or something like that. And so. Uh, it sometimes it really pays off to turn your TV into a smart TV by just you know plugging in one of these dongles. I guess there's something else I should have said, although I, I think most everybody here knows this already, is that you do need to have a Wi-Fi connection for something like this to work. So you're going to need a, a router, a wireless router. Uh, I know there I've seen some of the early Roku uh, devices come out where they had a Ethernet port on them where you could plug in a cable if you didn't have a wireless router, but. I bought one at Myron the other day for $30, and you know it doesn't have to be an expensive thing to, to hook up a, a Wi-Fi uh, signal. So that that is kind of a must. And hey, if you have a nice neighbor that's got a broadband connection, you never know they might let you tap on the system. Yeah. You know? that, that's always a possibility. You know what really surprised me? I'm, I'm fortunate to have a connection with uh, through a charter. They've got a pretty high-speed connection. And, you know, I'll have my two computers going and a Roku at the same time, and it doesn't seem to be a problem. Once in a while, I have a little buffering problem, but I'm... I'm I have another question when you're ready. Yes. I'm, I'm working with an antiquated uh, computer, so, you know, I'm one of these guys that doesn't want to spend money unless he has to, so... Uh, 
That's part of the reason my, my uh, buffering is probably more than it needs to be. Yes, what was your question? Uh, actually, it's a, a comment, because one of the things we talk about is the cost of these, all the services we tie into. So I, I found that there's a service called billcutters.com that they will, you can contact them and they'll negotiate for you the price. For instance, they, I have DirecTV, they negotiate the price $60 off per month for my uh, DirecTV. Now they take half of whatever they negotiate you down to, but they'll negotiate for your DirecTV or your charter, your internet services, your telephone services, your cell phone services. Uh, so if you're not into negotiating yourself, calling up these companies yourself, you can use billcutters.com. B-I-L-L-C-U-T-T-E-R-Z.com. Thank you for sharing that. I'm glad you reminded me of something I meant to talk about. A lot of times when I go out to somebody's house uh, and they let the note, they let the cable company or the satellite company know that they're about to pull the plug on them, the cable company will say, wait, we'll work a better deal with you. What can we do to keep you happy, to keep you as a customer? So that might be a, a little strategy you can use to keep your bills a little bit lower. Uh, keep in mind, though, if it doesn't work, you know, you might find yourself uh, having to settle for this newer technology here. And. Uh, you know, I guess uh, I, I recommend people try these things first to see if you're happy with it. You know, like I said, if you've already got a Wi-Fi connection, it costs you very little to try one out. And uh, like Mike was saying, he's real happy with it. You cut the cord how long ago? Two years. Two years now. What about like um, the Fox News Channel? Have you been able to get excerpts from it or stream it? Yeah, I, I can. I can watch that. Um, there's about five or six different live streams of the Fox News Channel that are running on YouTube at any given time. Uh, but you can also pay on some of these services, like I was saying, the Hulu Live um, uh, allows adding the Fox News Channel, and I believe that Sling also does it. Um, so those are some options. That's good to know. That's, uh, Sling was nine, nine. They have different packages, don't yeah, they? One was nine to ninety-nine a month, and I think they had a more advanced one where they gave you some more channels. And that's the other thing I, I should have mentioned. That also is that a lot of the channels you get on your your Roku device uh, aren't free, and um, you want to keep that in mind. That you know you don't want to necessarily uh, go in there thinking you're going to get everything for free. There, there are some they'll ask you to pay for, and then a lot of them they make you go online to be able to activate them, like the PBS channel. They'll let you stream it for free, but for some reason they want you to go on your computer and sign up and get a password and all that. And speaking of passwords and signing up, I don't know why Roku decided to do it this way, but basically they they have it set up so when you buy your Roku device, it's not going to be a thing where you can just plug it in, it's going to work instantly. They will want you to go online, sign up, give them the credit card information. By the way, I found out you can use a, what do you call those, prepaid credit cards if you don't want them getting into something that uh, you know, potentially could uh, cost you a lot of money if somebody were to get on your Roku device and start ordering tons of movies. I like the idea of using a prepaid credit card myself because it's, it's only going to have so much money on it. I've had credit card fraud done a couple times. So maybe just a little bit paranoid. But, um, but it's not hard to do it. But when, you, when you set up an account on Roku, you can actually add channels to your uh, homepage. And it, it, you know, if, any, if any of this sounds technical and too complicated, it's really not. Once you do it, you'll pick it up real quick. They made these things pretty user friendly. And I'm, I'm glad to see that because I'm, I'm not somebody who likes to you know, just try to figure all this high tech uh, rocket science stuff out. I mean, this, I'll leave that to the rascals in the computer club here. I like to keep it simple. Yes. Wait, wait for the microphone. Is it possible just to try out Roku or something like this on your your computer to see if you want to do it or not? Yeah. Uh, I see Mike shaking his head. Yes, sir. I, I, uh, 
hopefully. So I know that you were also saying that you downloaded a lot of the applications onto your tablet. Yes, and my tablet has probably 50 different uh, sites, channels. Some of them are free, some are subscription. So are you able to get all the, all the YouTube applications, I'm sorry, Roku applications on your tablet? Uh, I don't subscribe to you, Roku, so I don't. But I do the Apple TV, and I do I the, uh, the Google Dong things. So. And you can have both of those. Uh, you can have all of them to put in your TV. You can have all four devices. And if you, you have four HDMI. You also mentioned that you, you like to uh, cast the uh, whatever's on your tablet onto your television. Right, absolutely. Anything yeah. that you're looking on the internet. And, and we're talking about one of these devices here that plugs mm -hmm. into your uh, HDMI port. Yeah. And it will stream video. Absolutely. Oh, look at that. <laughs> It's, it's amazing, that, amazing what you get on the... On this, this was done with a drone, by the way. My friend Mike has a, has a drone, and... Uh, he, yeah, that's Steve. Oh, great, right. we have a couple of drone people. Yeah. Um, we're going to take a little bit break, but if you would, uh, I know people will come up and ask you some questions for a few minutes, and then maybe we'll start again, and uh, just for a few minutes, because people rethink about things, and then they have more questions. Sure, no, that's questions, great. Questions, questions. All right, so we're going to take our 10-minute break. Uh, see you back here in a few minutes. Don't forget uh, Dr. Tank's birthday party.